Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, greetings to all of you wherever you are in the world. It is with enormous pleasure and it is a, certainly a great privilege to be joined today by Alex Gorski, who is the CEO and Chairman of Johnson & Johnson. I think it's safe to say that he is CEO of one of the uh, biggest and most important healthcare companies in the world. And uh, more than that, CEO of one of the most admired companies of any kind uh, in the world. In turn, Alex himself is greatly admired. He is a, a leader among the CEO community and known not only for his, his wonderful stint as CEO of j, &J uh, but has also been uh, a leader in the broader business community um, as, as we struggle with the changing expectations of what it means to be a CEO in the world today. I also say that the j, j has been a great partner to the, the Fuqua School uh, over the years and uh, that the j, j ranks are populated with many, many Fuqua alums. And so uh, it's a wonderful partnership. And Alex, we are just so thrilled to have you join us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I really look forward to our conversation. So uh, I sh probably should also mention that, uh, that on your board, you do have some Duke representation. You've got, uh, you've got one of my faculty members, uh, which I wonder by transitivity, to what, what is that make our relationship? But, uh, but Mark <laughs> McClellan, uh, Mark McClellan is on your board uh, and Gene Washington, of course, the chancellor of the Duke Health System. So. Uh, so what do you think of Duke? Are, are those two representing us well? Well, I think they do an outstanding job of representing uh, not only Duke, but the, the, the broader healthcare community. And um, I couldn't be more proud to have them on my board. Uh, it's not very often you, you have physicians, leaders, executives of that caliber, with that kind of experience level. And uh, it's, it's a really a privilege to have them uh, on our board. So I'm, I'm going to jump right into uh, the topic of the day, which every day seems to be COVID. And uh, I, I want to put this in perspective, which is to say that COVID really only represents a tiny fraction of your business, um, and yet it probably consumes an inordinate amount of your time. And I'm wondering, are you, are you getting sick of having to talk about COVID all the time? Well, look, uh, none of us could have imagined, and I certainly could not when I started with Johnson & Johnson more than 30 years ago, uh, that I would ever be in this role, let alone be in this position when the world was facing likely one of its most challenging pandemics in history, and that we would in fact be playing a very central role in the discovery, development, and you know, ultimately the distribution of, of one of the lead vaccine candidates. Um, it, uh, it's been quite a ride, uh, I must say, uh, you know, it started, uh, at the very beginning with, um, you know, just really the remarkable science, uh, that really, uh, was the byproduct of, uh, more than a decade of research, uh, on a vaccine platform that we had been working on, uh, and that had been deployed in areas such as Africa for diseases such as Ebola, uh, it was uh, complemented with the great insights of uh, our scientists who you know, very quickly took some of the genomic information uh, that came out very early uh, and uh, they adapted it and uh, you know, really did their best to come up with what they felt was the right balance of safety and efficacy, deliverability, uh, and, uh, and you know, within literally a matter of months, uh, we were able to, uh, you know, begin helping millions of people around the world. And, uh, and I, I couldn't be more proud. And look, and these were, in addition to being great scientists and physicians and engineers, these were moms and dads themselves who were, you know, dealing with challenges at home, just as we all were. Uh, and uh, to bring that kind of science to life in such a, port, a short period of time, uh, again, I just couldn't be more proud. So it, it is a big week uh, in terms of this, uh, this booster uh, proposal is in front of the FDA and, and supposedly they're going to review that and act uh, in the coming week. So tell us, tell us your views on, uh, on the, the, the whole situation with the booster option. Sure, Bill. Well, look, um, 
another thing that we've learned on this is that uh, this virus, you know, unfortunately, uh, is quite efficient. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, that it's quite challenging uh, in the way that it's evolved. We've seen it with the new variants that have come out. Uh, and, and I think another consistency throughout this pandemic is that we've had to learn our way through this. And, um, you know, what we found is that over time, all the vaccines, you know, are showing some decrease in efficacy, consistent with what we see, you know, in, in many other classes of vaccines. And at the same time, we're seeing, again, variants that are becoming even more virulent and, uh, and more challenging. And uh, so with that in mind, uh, there's a number of studies that have taken place already and that continue uh, with all the vaccine candidates. Uh, we submitted our you know, package to the FDA just over the, the past week or so. And uh, you know, we're anxious to have a conversation with them to look for ways where you know, we can uh, perhaps even make it more effective uh, around the world uh, as we go forward. And really as this become, as we move from a pandemic to this becoming more of an endemic issue uh, and, and hopefully get to a point, whether it's through uh, the infections that have already taken uh, place around the world with patients or all the vaccinations that, uh, you know, we can reach le some level of immunity that signals a significant shift in the, you know, overall trend with this virus. So one of the one of the things that has been really pronounced in in this country is the whole issue of vaccine hesitancy, and what's interesting is that, uh, of course, as a as a company that's in that vaccine space, uh, that that's an issue that that's very relevant for J and J, but there's some data that have come out suggesting that the broader business community is the group that really should be attacking this issue of vaccine hesitancy. There was a survey done by the, uh, the, the group running the Edelman Trust Barometer, and uh, of all the respondents, 84% said that their companies should be attacking vaccine hesitancy. So what, what is your take on vaccine hesitancy, and, and how can we really start to make progress on an issue that, that seems to have people dug in? Look, we, we understand that, um, you know, there's a lot of people uh, that frankly find the science very complex, uh, where there may be historical issues uh, that result in them having an anxiety, a concern about vaccines. And at the same time, we realize, again, that this is one of the most challenging, you know, healthcare or issues that really we faced in generations. And that's why all along in the discovery and development, we try to do our very best to educate patients and stakeholders along the way. I was very proud of the fact, the way that the industry and the other pharmaceutical CEOs who are involved in the development of vaccine partnered and actually issued a statement, you know, where we made a commitment to following the most stringent clinical development guidelines as well as regulatory guidelines before making our vaccines available. Uh, which we've done. Uh, we've tried to partner closely with governments around the world uh, to make sure that people had the right information, the right kind of education. I must say it's been challenging at times because never have we had such a spotlight on the vaccine, on the development of a vaccine, let alone how that data uh, is reviewed, um, how it's critiqued, and how it's eventually used for approval of a product. And we've been seeing that real time. Uh, you know, in society. Uh, and, um, and, and so look, I think overall, the, um, the level of acceptance uh, is pretty close to what we would have projected early on based upon some of the, the data that we had. And we knew, look, that the last 25% uh, would be a challenge. Mm -hmm. And so getting to those who are most at risk first, uh, getting information for use among adolescents and younger patients, getting the booster information uh, that you've mentioned, again, in a very transparent, open, uh, published manner was going to be critical. And then, of course, we also felt it was critical to set the example as a company. Uh, and uh, here at J&J, &J, we, we have asked all of our employees in the United States uh, to, uh, and we required them to have a vaccine. Uh, we have certain exceptions. But I've been very proud of the way our organization overall has responded uh, and I think, uh, you know, rallied behind this particular cause. 
and, and really more broadly in the business community, whether it's the business roundtable, the business council, uh, I think the way that companies have tried to partner and, and again, educate, encourage, do everything possible to, to get people vaccinated. Because we know that, look, until we reach that tipping point, uh, that this, uh, this virus is going to continue uh, to mutate and present a real danger, uh, not only to those who are unvaccinated, but you know, as we've seen here, even to those who you know, may be immunocompromised or have other underlying conditions. And so I'm encouraged by the recent trends, uh, but I think we're going to have to stay vigilant. And I think there's an important role, in fact, for business to play in helping get that done. Yeah. So in, in addition to some of the things that you, you described uh, in, with respect to providing accurate information, uh, a huge issue associated with vaccine hesitancy has to be the, the misinformation. So when, when you hear about all these stories about the, you know, the crazy things that are, you, people are being chipped and so on, do you just shake your head and say, this, you know, this, this is ridiculous, or, or is there a way that, again, the business community can actively combat this misinformation epidemic uh, where, where, once again, the, the, the expectations are on the part of the, the employees of, of these companies that you will do something. So what, what, what can we do to combat misinformation? Well, look, I think it's important to combat misinformation very broadly across society. Uh, you know, especially in an environment where we're inundated with social media. And unfortunately, we don't always have the quality checks in place. And uh, that's why it's so incumbent upon when, when you're talking to your stakeholders, when you're talking to your employees or your students, that it's not only important to help educate them about the data, you know, regarding the vaccines, but also to help put it into perspective, also to help teach them about the sources you know, of information and the process that's used in science in science to ensure that you get, you know, the right kind of review. Uh, but uh, look, I think we also have to all acknowledge that it's a challenge, just like many other issues are in our society. And, uh, you know, that's why it's all the more reason for government, for business, for the healthcare system to partner and try to have as unified of a voice as possible when we're explaining and educating about these issues. So uh, I, I promise that the whole conversation will not be about COVID and vaccines, but- uh, Rest assured, something... I've had a lot, Bill, I've had a lot of these conversations, so <laughs> it, it's okay. I understand it's, uh, yeah. it's a topic day so, but, but one thing that, that really stands out uh, around your, your vaccine and, and how you've uh, treated it is a decision that you made not to make any profits during the pandemic. And so the, the this is not a decision that everyone made. So uh, walk us through how you how you came to that decision to say we you know, we have some uh, broader goal in mind than the short term profitability in this in this context. I mean, well, look, I, I I can understand why, particularly maybe in a business school setting, people would say, well, you know, how can you do that uh, and is that, uh, is that the right recommendation or not? And, and we felt from the very earliest moments uh, when we were uh, you know, trying to develop the vaccine and make a difference for the pandemic, that our ultimate goal was to ensure uh, that we could get access for a vaccine for the world. And, uh, and we wanted to do it in a way where first of all, the testing, the development work that we did was part of a global program uh, that, the world would not have confidence, for example, unless we did studies and you know, had trials around the world that we uh, ensured that we had a diverse array of patients participate in the trial uh, uh, that represented the global population. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the characteristics, uh, such as a single shot, uh, one that required little refrigeration, were also conducive to really widespread distribution because while the, the discovery, the development, the engineering, the chemistry, the biology was certainly complex, we also know that that infamous last mile is perhaps the most challenging aspect of you know, ensuring that you're ultimately going to get patients treated. And we also wanted to make sure that price and cost was not a barrier. Uh, and, uh, and so we had quite a debate 
Uh, but you know, we felt that a company with the size, the scale of Johnson & Johnson uh, should do everything possible to basically remove the issue of cost and price from the conversation of access. And we announced that you know, at the very beginning of our program. And we've been very proud of the fact that uh, you know, I think as a result of that, uh, we've been able to garner very broad and diverse uh, distribution around the world. And, and we're still in early days. We anticipate that uh, the overwhelming majority of doses for our vaccine will be used um, in the emerging and developing markets you know, around the rest of the globe, where it will be so important for us to get people vaccinated to ensure that you know, we have long-term control of COVID-19. Yeah. So the, where, where you've just gone relates to something I've heard you say before, which is one of the, the big insights from uh, the reaction to COVID and the pandemic is the need for really thinking about public global health and uh, that, that we need to have mechanisms in place that, that, that recognize it's a global issue. It's, it's not an issue that respects country borders. And yet what we've seen uh, is a lot of nationalism in response. So how, how, do we, you know, how do we get people to buy into your vision that this really is a global problem? And if we're gonna fix locally, uh, what we need fixing, we can't just end our focus locally. We have to think globally. Yeah, look, I, you know, I think during times of s significant and arguably severe duress, unfortunately, we can see the rise of nationalism take hold where each country, each region feels as though they need to have their own local source of supply and approach. And of course, we know that when we're facing this kind of a pandemic uh, and given the technical challenges of uh, vaccine development and distribution, uh, that in the timelines that we're looking at, that that's just not possible. Uh, so in many ways, global cooperation was absolutely essential. Again, not only for the safety of individual countries, but for the safety of the world. And, and I must say, uh, in my more than 35 years in the industry, I've never seen the kind of partnership take place between globally regulators, uh, the developers, the different companies that were participating, and even global leaders. Uh, and, and I'd like to think that there are elements of that template that we could use for the future to say, look, how could we accelerate the development of certain medications at an even greater rate uh, in the future versus maybe the traditional path that we have taken without, of course, compromising safety uh, or compliance or quality uh, in any way. I think we've learned some important lessons. I think we've, we've learned how to work with different countries in different regions um, in trying to build up reciprocal agreements uh, and in the kind of partnerships that, frankly, that made it available for us to be able to distribute not only uh, in the G G7 or the G20, uh, but also in many other you know, parts of the world. So yes, there are definitely challenges, uh, but we remain committed throughout this to, again, taking a global approach. And, and there's one thing I'm certain of, this likely won't be the last pandemic uh, or significant health challenge that we face. And as you know, and I'm sure can appreciate, global public health has always ended up, unfortunately, being about the 11th you know, most important priority among the top 10 list. Right. And I think we've, we've learned through this that if we don't have strong, durable, resilient, agile, global public health programs, we don't have national security, we don't have economic security, and frankly, we don't have security as a society uh, overall. And, and that, that takes investment. That's going to take some movement from what I would call effectiveness and efficiency to maybe redundancy and resilience. Uh, and it's going to take a long-term commitment in terms of investment as well uh, to make sure that we're better prepared and in a better position uh, when that next pandemic should, uh, should challenge us. So this has been uh, you know, a very difficult, traumatic time for, uh, for so many people. Uh, for you, it, it has to have been just nonstop craziness and stress and, uh, and, and so on. Have you had any time to reflect and say, 
you know, having gone through this, I, I learned something about myself that, that I didn't know before. Uh, it, has it led to any self-discovery? Oh, absolutely. But look, I think we've all learned a lot about ourselves and, and we've probably learned a lot about our families. You know, when is the last time we spend as much time with our families, with our spouses, with our loved ones uh, as we have, you know, during this pandemic? You know, very early on, unfortunately, I lost a very close friend and colleague, one of the security people that had worked with me for, you know, about a decade, unfortunately, was taken by COVID-19. And I had other family members that ended up getting it along the way. Uh, and, and so I think it's, I think it's touched all of us and, and changed our lives. You know, as, as I think about the past 24 months, you know, a few things come to mind. I think that, you um, you know, one is this idea of the importance of purpose in what we do. Uh, you know, while I've always felt honored and privileged to work in the healthcare industry where you know you're making a difference in people's lives, when you know you're literally working on something that can help save the world, uh, the, the level of commitment and engagement that that resulted in with our company just can't be understated. Uh, and, uh, you know, people were literally working round the clock remotely, uh, again, all dealing with their own family issues, but bringing that purpose, you know, to the work that they were doing every day in, in a very tangible, real way, uh, I, I think was very important. The next was, um, look, I think we all just about got zoomed to death. Uh, you know, we and went from, we uh, that's right. You know, we went from having to commute into the office and be there and come home where, you know, every day, literally your first zoom was starting by six or 7 AM and it was going till 7 PM. Uh, and while it, it really provided us with an incredibly effective way of engaging and being able to continue our business operations and, and, and stay productive, I think we missed the human contact. You know, we miss those, you know, informal sidebar conversations, those, you know, other incidental interactions that all of us, I think, crave as humans. Uh, and, and I just, you know, came to realize that, you know, while I think a virtual setting is very helpful and is going to change the way that we work and learn and interact, I don't think it will ever be a complete replacement for that level of personal connection and, you uh, you know, engagement uh, that's really important. And, and last but not least, look, I think this has taught us all about the importance of health. And uh, I think what COVID has shown is, look, the importance of being healthy when you're facing this kind of a situation uh, and, and taking care of ourselves, building daily rituals so that we're not only sitting in front of Zoom all day, but so whether it's, uh, the way we eat, the way we sleep, uh, the way we stay active, or you know, coming up with rituals to help us all stay healthy, because we know the healthier we are, that the you know likelihood for a better outcome when we're faced with this kind of a situation. So, uh, I think it's incumbent, incumbent upon all of us to reflect maybe a little bit more about our own health and what we can do to stay healthy and stay our best. So I understand you've always been very fit, but that you're you're coming out of this even more fit than when the pandemic hit. Oh, I think so. I mean, um, you know, I uh, because I wasn't traveling as much, uh, you know, as often as possible. I, I would try sometimes to do an activity in the morning, and then even one later in the afternoon to take a break before I might do something else. Uh, and I, I found it to be a really important way to to keep balance. And, uh, and frankly, to, uh, to stay healthy and focused. Yeah. So as you think about um, advice for emerging leaders who will, who will navigate uh, the, the, the post-pandemic world, and, and notice I didn't say post-COVID because it, it will just switch to endemic, as you said. Right. Uh, but, but what lessons can you share with them in terms of how they can successfully lead uh, in, in what is fundamentally a different environment than what we had a couple of years ago. Yeah, no, look, uh, I, I think that um, this, uh, the COVID environment, the pandemic environment uh, has taught us all lessons about leadership, uh, about ourselves, and uh, how we can be more effective as leaders uh, in our organizations. And, you know, for me, it started in a number of ways. One, I think, it really demonstrated the importance of 
being able to adapt and, and take an agile approach to learning. You know, think about it. How many of us even had some of the vernacular, the, the language of the pandemic uh, about, you know, an incidence rate, the virus rate, the R, you know, the R factor, all these other issues. And now they're just used every day. And uh, we all became experts, not only on the virus, but uh, on epidemiology, on vaccines. Uh, and, you know, I think what it, it, it demonstrates is, you know, making sure that we remain curious, uh, that we can absorb a lot of information, uh, that we don't just rely on data, but we can apply critical thinking to it, put it into perspective. You know, and in this case, you know, we didn't have an option. We, uh, we were facing a big challenge as a company. Uh, not only to keep our day-to-day -day business ongoing, but also to, in parallel, be able to be developing this vaccine. Uh, and so the ability to learn and to, you know, quickly be able to absorb a lot of information, I think, for leaders today is more important than ever. I think another really important characteristic is one of communicating. You know, I found during this pandemic that employees and stakeholders, they want to hear from the leadership of the organization. And so while on one hand, as a CEO, you always want to say, well, it's never about me. On the other hand, it is incumbent upon you as a leader to be communicating, to be engaging, to be as authentic uh, and I think realistic as possible with your people, you know, to give them, I think, an understanding of, you know, what's the path ahead look like? Uh, what's a reason to believe? Uh, how are we going to navigate our way through? And, uh, and so making sure that you're communicating on a routine basis, you're using a lot of different media to make that happen uh, is also really important. You know, and last but not least, I think it's uh, how do we adapt our leadership styles uh, working in these kind of virtual environments uh, and figuring out, you know, how do you partner? How do you make new introductions? How do you follow up with uh, in, in people in different ways? I think it's required all of us to kind of rethink our leadership tool chest uh, in the way that we uh, interact and the way that we, you know, lead and, and follow and engage with the people around us. Terrific. So I'm, I'm going to now move away from COVID okay. and take you, take you back in time a little bit, uh, which is we have, we have many veterans in the Duke community and, and we think they contribute amazing things. Uh, to our community. And so you made a choice to, to go to West Point. Uh, tell me what, what leadership lessons have stuck with you throughout your career post West Point that have been really helpful for you as you navigate the world of business? Well, look, um, I um, first of all, want to thank everyone who's participating in this program uh, who, who served their country. Uh, I mean, without their sacrifice, without their service, we would never be able to have these kind of opportunities to engage. Uh, and whether it were the veterans or the families that were supporting them, uh, thanks, thanks to all of you uh, for what you've done. Um, and look, for me, um, I, I, I was quite fortunate. You know, I grew up in a very middle-class family in the Midwest. Uh, my father was a Korean War veteran. I had five brothers and sisters. Uh, and, uh, and I thought in... And, and once he had served this country in the Korean War, he stayed in the Army Reserves. And I thought it was quite natural for, you know, one of your parents to put a uniform on once a month and, uh, you know, spend the weekend doing service. And that was a role model that was really imprinted on me since I was, you know, about that tall. And, um, and, and you know, having that kind of an example uh, really inspired me to think of going to a place like West Point. I think the uh, you know duty honor country uh, ethos uh, of the institution was something that you know I also found very attractive. Uh, it was a great intellectual leadership, physical challenge, uh, all at the same time. Uh, and and really some of the lessons that I learned there, as well as my time in the Army, Bill, related to I think one resilience and grit, uh, and that. Uh, you know, whenever you're dealing with issues that there are times when you're going to fall down and you have to pick yourself back up and, uh, you know, being able to always stay focused on, uh, hey, how can we get through this particular challenge? Uh, how can we figure out a solution? 
uh, was, was a mentality, was a kind of spirit uh, that was ingrained in us at the, both at the academy and in the army that I try to carry with me today. Uh, you know, next is there, there is no such thing as leadership without fellowship. And, you know, being able to engage and empathize, uh, inspire a team of diverse people to do something that maybe they wouldn't think they could do on their own, or were one plus one plus one equals six instead of just three, that's really the magic of leadership. Uh, and, uh, and it doesn't happen unless people feel as though you're approachable, that you care about them, uh, that you're committed to them. Uh, and you know, ultimately, that, that's, they'll place their belief in you, and uh, that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, and so that's certainly a lesson that I've you know, taken with me into the corporate world. And, and last but not least, it's one of diversity. You know, I think one of the, uh, the great features or aspects of the military is that you don't get to choose the people you're around all the time. Uh, and whether that's your roommate, uh, whether it's the people in your squad or your team, uh, you know, I often found myself in circumstances in the army where I was a minority in the group. Uh, and, and, but still being able to connect with and bond and gain the trust and, 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 and frankly, understand the humanity of a very diverse group of people that you're involved with, that you depend on every day, really made me better appreciate the power of diversity uh, and, and how that led us to, frankly, be a better team, uh, come up with new ways of thinking and be able to execute better in the long run. And, uh, and again, that's also something that I really apply, um, you know, in my day-to-day -day job as well here at Johnson & Johnson. So when you, when you transitioned out of the Army, you went to J&J. Uh, what, what was it that sold you on that option uh, and, and making that transition? Well, you know, look, there were, there were several factors. And I wish I could say that I had some grand strategy where I had it all figured out and I knew exactly you knew what I wanted to You knew you were going to be CEO someday, yeah. Yeah, no, it, that was not the case. Uh, you know, I, I looked at a range of different options, but ultimately it came down to a couple of issues. I think one is I wanted to join a company with purpose where I really felt part of something bigger than myself. And uh, in fact, I can remember when I was in the military because of the esprit de corps and uh, you know, the trust, the environment, the culture that we were in, I was a little concerned that when I got you know, out of that environment, would I find the same thing in the civilian world? And, uh, and being able to interview, and I remember the very first question I had in my Johnson & Johnson interview was, so what do you think about our credo, which is our value system? And, uh, and so um, you know, understanding that and, and really the importance of a principles-based organization was something that I spent a lot of time on. Two, um, I wanted to be doing something that would marry, you know, in some ways, certain trends that I knew were going to be important for business and society, you know, things like technology uh, with, with the ability to really do good for people. And I think, you know, one of the, the, the great things about healthcare is ultimately, you know, that your products and services are going to help people live longer, healthier, and hopefully better lives. And uh, so, you know, working in the healthcare industry, uh, where I really felt a calling, a mission uh, to what we're doing, and, and to see how the technology could enable that, uh, particularly during a time of, you know, just an explosion of, you know, uh, advancements, whether it's in our pharmaceutical area, our medical device area, or consumer area, was something else that you know really attracted me into healthcare, uh, and, um, and and look, and I was fortunate to join a company that really believed in the development of its people, uh, that wasn't hiring you necessarily for a job, but was really hiring you for a career, and you know going to provide you the growth, the development, the educational you know opportunities, uh, so that you could continue to grow you know as a leader and, and, and as a colleague and. Uh, I was really fortunate to find a home that exemplified all those areas. So you you have spent uh, a lot of your career at J and J, not not one hundred percent, but the vast majority, which makes you pretty unusual. And uh, and especially in the world today, people will pop from company to company quite often. Uh, but can you can you give our students some advice around? 
you know, as they're as they're facing these opportunities and they're thinking about, is it time to leave or do I need to stay? How, how do you how do you go through that decision calculus um, as you're thinking about your personal choices, which which will happen again and again throughout the course of a career? Yeah, well, that's that's it. It's an interesting question and certainly a broad one. And uh, and I'm always a little cautious about trying to impose you know, my particular path on others because things have changed. But I do think that there are some common themes. You know, one is I would al- I always encourage, um, you know, young, um, younger employees or colleagues to think about being in an industry and in a company where there are, are that's growing and has growth opportunities. You know, when you are in industries, when you're in a company, that's growing by its very nature, it's going to provide more opportunities. Uh, and, uh, you know, joining a, a company like Johnson and Johnson that was growing at a very rapid rate, uh, you know, early on, it meant that they were going to mean new roles, uh, again, n- new lessons that where I could learn new skills to, and capabilities to be picked up. And so the very nature of the markets and the company that I was in Kind of propelled and pulled my career along. So I would encourage, you know, all of them to think first about that. What, what kind of field, what kind of area is likely to be growing so that, you know, I can become part of that. Two, don't think of your career necessarily as just a vertical ascent. <laughs> and that, you know, what's most important is that you build a strong foundation in the skills and the competencies and the leadership uh, that you're learning and then that you you make sure that you're get, you're you're measuring yourself by experiences, by skill sets and capabilities, not just by job titles. Uh, it's it's the person I believe who gets their best, not necessarily first, that will do best in the long run. And uh, you know sometimes you'll see people who will have a very rapid ascent, uh, but haven't necessarily picked up the skills that are necessary to be successful at that next level. Uh, and and so sometimes. There have been several times in my career where I took a horizontal move into a new sector, for example, or to a new region, uh, or to take on a different kind of challenge that ultimately really made uh, made me a much more effective, much more seasoned executive, so I could be successful in the long term. Um, You know, next, don't try to develop the perfect resume. You know, I think all too often. People almost look at like a chess game. Well, I have to do this job or this job. And it seemed like every job that I had within Johnson & Johnson, I was taking over the number 13, uh, let's call it group uh, out of the top 10 or you know, the, the product that had the biggest challenge. And, um, and, and many people along the way would say, oh my gosh, why would you ever do that? That's not the traditional path. Or, you know, and, and, and really I, I trusted in the management team that I was working with. Um, I knew that if I, if I got in and I made a difference, I learned something new that that was, you know, going to be important for my future development, you know, and ultimately, um, I, I found that that was the best way, uh, to find success, to be recognized, you know, and ultimately to be rewarded. But there were many examples along the way where it was the atypical move versus, you know, maybe the, the one that seemed to get me there the fastest or that would have been considered the traditional path. So, so even though you didn't have like a, a, a well laid out plan, you did get to become CEO. And uh, so I'm going to fast forward to 2012, you become CEO. And can you reflect on how your role as CEO has changed over those years? Yeah, look, I think the role of CEO has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. Uh, and um, look, the expectations uh, about, you know, how a CEO communicates, what issues a CEO gets involved with, um, what he or she may do in an organization have evolved pretty dramatically. Uh, and I think that, that, look, that's in, indicative of the world that we live in, uh, where there's a demand for real time, 24 seven engagement, communication uh, and dialogue. Uh, and you know, I remember when I was just came into the job, one of my first uh, objectives was I wanted to do a blog. And early on, I was advised, well, I should really think carefully before I do a blog. And uh, I remember saying, well, 
Why? Because that's the way people communicate. And they said, well, yeah, but you know, somebody might speak back to you. And I go, yeah, that's the point. Uh, you actually want to have that kind of dialogue, you know, with your group. And, um, and, and I found that, you know, by having that kind of ongoing conversation with the company, uh, the goodwill, the trust, the relationship that that builds over time, and it's not without risk. Uh, you know, there were times, for example, during the Charlottesville challenge where, you know, we had a very active debate and dialogue online throughout the organization. But what I was proud of is because we had already established a rhythm and a pattern and an expectation, the by and large, it was incredibly respectful, it was incredibly professional, and actually, I think, helpful to our organization to be able to navigate through, you know, very difficult issues of of racism, uh, exclusion, uh, and change in our society. Uh, so I think that's changed. I think the expectation about what should a CEO stand for? I mean, the day of it being, hey, as long as I deliver on my bottom line, you know, that that that's primary and that's really what matters. I think there's an expectation now that, no, you also need to do, do good and do well by other stakeholders, whether it's the, the consumers, the customers who use your products, or whether it's the, the employees who frankly enable us to do what we do every day, the communities where we live and we, where we operate, in addition to your shareholders, taking an and and approach versus what I would call an either or approach and, and understanding the impact that we have on culture, on society, on some of these other issues. Look, I think you need to be thoughtful uh, because every day, uh, you could find yourself in a position of having to take a, a stand, uh, so to speak. Uh, but I think being thoughtful, recognizing that there are clearly times when it's important for leaders to lean in on certain issues, uh, but also staying focused on delivering on the expectations of your stakeholders so that you maintain the credibility and the wherewithal to ultimately make a difference is more important than ever. So um, I referenced some data from the, the Edelman Trust Barometer, and, and they're really highlighting that, uh, that your employees, not your specific employees, but employees of, of various companies expect their CEOs to, to speak up and tackle various issues, uh, ranging from uh, you know, racial equity and justice to climate change and, and so on and so forth, which uh, may be something that a CEO of a number of years ago was not expected to, to address. So given the, the, the reality of polarization in society, and by the way, these same people who want you to say something to CEO are also saying, but don't take political sides. You don't, and all these issues, of course, become politicized. So how do you make decisions about when to speak up, when, when to take a stand and so on, in this very complicated world with an expectation that you'll do something, but, but don't, don't take our company you know, to one side or the other of the political spectrum. Well, look, it's not easy. It's not for the faint of heart, but what I would say is I try not to worry about who I'm pleasing, but what are the principles by which we stand? And um, look, I'm very proud, for example, of the work that uh, I was able to do at the Business Roundtable several years ago where we actually change the concept about the purpose of a corporation uh, in our charter uh, to, and to expand it to go from just shareholder primacy to one involving, hey, what is your commitment to your customers, to your employees, to your communities, as well as to your shareholders? And, and I was very proud of the fact that you know, the overwhelming majority of members of you know, the BRT, the Business Roundtable, largest companies in the United States and you know, representing large global organizations immediately signed up, uh, recognizing that if you wanna create long-term sustainable value and cultures that you needed to take that and, and not an either or approach. Uh, and uh, so that's certainly something that I think I'm proud of. And, and I think many companies are adopting. You know, in our case at Johnson & Johnson, uh, we, we prioritize, first of all, healthcare. You know, as the world's largest healthcare company, if there's an issue that relates to healthcare, we think it's critical that we have a voice. So, for example, in, in some of the issues uh, that were raised, you know, over the past year around inequities and, and racism, 
uh, we felt that it was important to lean in in the area of inequities in healthcare, particularly uh, in diverse uh, communities around the country where we know that unfortunately, your zip code can be a bigger determinant of your health, likely health outcomes than your blood pressure. And that's, that's got to be fixed. That's got to be addressed in a different way. And that's why we're trying to get involved very directly and explicitly where we think we've got certain skills and capabilities and insights you know, to really make a difference. And, uh, and look, I'm encouraged more and more. And you know, I realize that from time to time, uh, CEOs will be caught in the political issues, uh, that you won't please everybody. Uh, and again, I think you, you need to remain thoughtful. You need to, to lean in where a company can make a difference. Uh, and, um, and I think, you know, again, done, done in the right way, it can be a powerful force, not only in business, but more broadly across society. So uh, you, you have been very outspoken on issues of racism. You, you are a passionate advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion to kind of make the point uh, uh, clear that you were talking about before. You've pledged $100 million to address uh, health disparities in communities of color. Uh, how, how did you get there? How, how, how did you get to the point where you say, I have to be, we have to be active in this space. We need to tackle these, these disparities. Well, look, why I'm, I'm proud of the long-term efforts that we've always had around many of these issues in Johnson & Johnson. You know, I think over the past year, um, the, many of the issues that we faced um, in the United States really represented kind of a change or an inflection point uh, for issues as it related to racism, social injustice. And, and as part of that, you know, frankly, we reached out more broadly to our organization and said, okay, what, should, what else should we be doing? What else must we do to make a difference? And you know, to put our organization to work uh, with, with things that we can readily address. And, and we said, it should first start right within Johnson & Johnson. Are we doing everything we can? And while we, you know, we've had very consistent programs through the years to ensure that our represent issues like our representation, our development, you know, with employees uh, represented the very best performance benchmarked against other companies. In certain other cases, we said we needed to be more explicit about the way we articulate our goals, just as we do our business goals, that we need to be more explicit and direct about the accountability and responsibility among our senior leaders for the success or the failure that's been observed over a period of time, just as we would with a business case. We recognize that we couldn't do it alone if we were going to have an impact on the communities, but how could we use our size, our scale, for good and partner with academic institutions, other organizations, and really bring together public-private partnerships that could invest in community health clinics, other programs that we know can have a direct you know, impact on health in some of these communities. Uh, and of course that takes resources, the dollars uh, that you, know, you just mentioned, uh, but it also takes us you know, getting our skills involved. You know, another big area for us were Things like clinical trials and the development of you know, new therapies and medications that could you know, have a, a positive impact on some of these impacted communities, uh, again, of color uh, and uh, of, of, you know, various ethnicities. And so as a result, what do, should we do with our clinical trial programs? How should we think differently about drug therapeutic development to address that? And so, look, I think we've we really took a hard look inside on you know, what kind of steps we could take to make a difference. I think we're making good progress, but there's still much more work that needs to be done. So it, it turns out that the, the most trusted institution to tackle issues of, of racial justice uh, is my employer. And so are you, are you optimistic that, uh, that the business community can step up to this moment and uh, and, and really earn that trust uh, in positive ways. Is this, is this a moment where business really does uh, accomplish really important things for society? Look, I am. And I think we should never waste a crisis like the one we experienced. I'm really encouraged by the way businesses have stepped up and again, made 
um, much more outspoken commitments in so many of these areas. I think it's going to be really important to hold ourselves accountable uh, to demonstrate to the public, not only with our words, but with our actions, what kind of differences you know, we're making in these areas. Uh, and I think it's incumbent upon us to also work together. Uh, where, you know, where there's many different initiatives now where you see companies partnering, working across what would usually be competitive lines to say, you know, what can we do to have a better impact, for example, on uh, some of our training and development programs, on reaching some of these other communities. So look, I still think there's a lot uh, that must be done, but I'm really encouraged with some of the early progress that we're seeing. Okay, so just a, a few more questions and, and then I'm gonna let you off the hook here. Uh, okay. The first one relates to something that you said, you know, dating back to your, your, your West Point years, uh, which is adversity, uh, when you face adversity, having the resilience to get through that. So uh, can, can you give us a little more uh, behind that statement, which is to say, you know, pe people have this image of you, you get to be CEO, so you must have led a magical life. And the reality is you've, you face plenty of adversity uh, in your life. And when, when you hit those moments, what is it that keeps you going that instead of lying there and saying, oh, you know, the, it, it's over, uh, woe is me, and to pick yourself up and, and to get back in the game? Sure. Well, look, for me, it... it really boils down to a couple of tenets. You know, one I think all of us have to understand as leaders is that the reason that we are actually placed into these roles and responsibilities is to make a difference and to deal with those challenges at hand. I mean, sometimes people think, well, okay, I'm, I'm a leader now and my desk is going to be clean and, you know, life is going to be great. And I find, no, it's just the opposite. What you're going to find is that, you know, the challenges that other people can't solve the problems that they face that sometimes can be business related, that could be personal uh, related, or ultimately the things that are going to land on your desk. And it's how you navigate, how you help others, how do you connect, uh, and ultimately how do you bring about solutions that really make a difference. I think, you know, Bill, the other uh, really important dynamic for students, especially as they're transitioning to business to remember is it's not about admiring the problem that makes one successful. It's about actually developing and implementing solutions to get through it. And um, I can't tell you how many times in my career I have heard people sound so incredibly, you know, uh, intellectual and bright and describe a problem in, in incredible detail, which is important to make sure you understand it. But while that's necessary, it's not sufficient. Because the next part of the equation is to actually be on that field and say, okay, now what do we need to do about it? What are the solutions? What's the best path? And then, of course, how do you mobilize, energize, and inspire a team to actually accomplish that particular goal? Uh, and, uh, and so I think, again, having that kind of a, of a mindset in, in business is really, really important. And, you know, and last but not least, I... I'm always inspired by the people around me. Uh, and, and if there's ever a time when I'm starting to feel sorry for myself or thinking, oh my gosh, another issue that I have to deal with, um, I, I just take inspiration from my colleagues uh, who, you know, I see the, the contributions that they're making, the efforts that they put forth. And, and frankly, it builds a spirit of there's no way I can let them down. Uh, and I think if you can build that kind of trusting culture where there's an openness and a dependency on each other, uh, where people are encouraged to collaborate, and uh, then you help them be their best, I, I really think it, it does ultimately you know, ensure the, the best for everybody. So two more questions that are wildly different. Uh, okay. the, the first one is... Um, that uh, that you've announced you're stepping down as a CEO, and uh, and so people spend all their time looking for advice around well how do, how do you get to be CEO and then how do you get to be a good CEO, and they ignore one really big thing which is you're not going to be CEO forever, and and so tell us about the leadership challenge of preparing for succession and and making sure that 
you know, you you if you're if you're working for a public company, you don't get to choose your successor necessarily. But how do you prepare to make sure that your successor is in turn successful? Well, look, I think the most important job that you have uh, as a CEO, um, in addition to really providing the moral compass and setting the right culture and tone in the organization is to pick your successor. And um, for you know, these jobs are challenging. Uh, they, they require years of development uh, and learning uh, to be prepared. And uh, in getting that right uh, is clearly a critical decision, not only for the CEO, but for the board of directors as well. And so very early on in my tenure, uh, I began having open conversations with our board of directors, kind of setting the expectation about, look, what are the, what are the kind of skill sets? What are the kind of characteristics that this environment will likely need, not just today, but 10 years from now to ensure success? And then how does that match against some of the high potential, high performing candidates that we have? And what steps should we be taking to you know, aggressively develop them in terms of roles, responsibility, different situations to give them the kind of depth and breadth of experiences that they were going to need, you know, to be successful. Uh, you know, a, a significant portion of all of our board meetings was actually spent on talent development. So while we would talk about, yes, what, you, what are you delivering for the quarter? What's your strategic plan? We have an entire board, one of our board meetings committed to just reviewing the senior leaders in our organization or the future leaders of our organization uh, and providing opportunities for the board to get to meet those people on a firsthand basis and in, in informal settings um, so that, you know, ultimately when we would get to a selection process, there would be a, a personal kind of connection. Uh, and, uh, and so those are, those are some of the steps. Uh, and, um, you know, look, I couldn't be more proud of my successor uh, I think Joaquin Duato, again, is a, a very credo uh, and value values-driven person. We've worked together for several decades. And again, he's worked around the globe, across our sectors. And I think, you know, well-prepared, and I can't wait to partner with him in my new role as executive chairman, uh, you know, as we turn to a new chapter here at Johnson & Johnson. Okay, so last question is, uh, what, what would the Alex of today uh, uh, what advice would you give to that newly minted MBA, Alex, from years ago, knowing um, what you now know? <laughs> well, uh, look, I'd, uh, there's a lot of advice. I, I th think the first thing that I would tell the newly minted MBA was, uh, you know, it's not what you learned in your MBA program that was so important. While, you know, there, of course, there's a certain level that it is, but what's most important is your ability and your curiosity to continue to learn. You know, if you think about the half-life of an education today, I think, Bill, it's much less than when you and I graduated from college. Uh, while principles will stay the same, I think if you just look at the rate and the pace of technology and expectations, uh, what's most important for the MBA students today is again, a hunger or curiosity to continuously learn and almost reinvent themselves and their skill sets and their capabilities. And uh, I would definitely give that advice uh, to the Alex, you know, that, uh, you know, graduated uh, from B school many years ago. You know, next I would say that, uh, look, there is no absolute one perfect path. Life is gonna be filled with a lot of twists and turns. And it's not, are you going to encounter hardships? It's how you respond to those hardships that's by far most important. And, uh, and last but not least, I think the, uh, the greatest satisfaction that I've taken is not necessarily from just the business results that are delivered, but it's from how you've impacted lives, whether it's patients in my case and working in healthcare or the employees that I've had a chance to grow and see them develop and you know, take on roles as presidents and CEOs or leading scientists or other figures. Uh, it's incredibly rewarding knowing that you've been able to impact the next generation of leaders. So Alex, thank you so much. Uh, the, the aspiration of, of every student in our community is to someday become a leader of consequence. And thank you for showing people what it means to achieve that goal. You are a wonderful exemplar. And I am just so very grateful that you've taken this time to, 
to help educate our community. Wonderful, wonderful time to, to uh, be together here. Well, Bill, you made this a very easy uh, discussion and conversation. I wish everybody the very best, not only of luck, but of good health. And uh, look forward to talking again, hopefully soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.